Gosford in East Lothian, the home of the 12th Earl of Weems. When he returned after the Second World War, he found his ancestral seat almost in ruins. Oh, gracious. Well, this was the kitchen with a, an opaque glass roof and family rooms on the uh, first and second story around it. Like many of the great houses of Britain during the war, Gosford had been an army base, with soldiers living in the house and tanks on the lawn. Military occupation often led to extensive damage. At Gosford, an army electrician had accidentally set fire to the ballroom, and four-fifths of the vast mansion was now uninhabitable. Like all great country houses, the grandeur of Gosford had been an expression of aristocratic power. Now, the family was reduced to living in the south wing. The aristocracy had reached an all-time low. In the 1945 election, Labour vigorously attacked privilege and the uneven distribution of wealth. Now a new parliament must be elected. The choice is between that same Conservative Party, which stands for private enterprise, private profit and private interests, and the Labour Party, which demands that in peace as in war, the interests of the whole people should come before those of a section. There don't seem to be any pigeons living in them now. Were they full? Hmm? Were they full of pigeons at one point? Oh, they had had pigeons in them, mm -hmm. but not now. At the Labour Party conference, Dennis Healy expressed the class-conscious sentiments of many servicemen. The upper classes in every country, he said, are selfish, depraved, dissolute and decadent. What we must do is talk about the decorations that we're going to have for the party on the 21st. Well, what is that party? I mean, who's coming to it? Gosford still has the marble hall and the 25 rooms leading off it. No, but... When Lord Weems grew up here before the war, this staircase led to rooms lined in white silk, hung with the portraits of Stuart kings. There were bathrooms made of marble and a whole corridor of bedrooms for bachelor guests. His second wife didn't know the house when it stood intact. Now most of it is a confusing jumble of ruins. I'm afraid I can't find the room just now. Well, there isn't one. No, but I, I did... I telling you. No, all right. There is no room we, here. We can look in beyond the big dining Unless room. Unless you go through the window and into that room. All right. Mm -hmm. Are these really bird ne bird's nests? It wasn't only military carelessness that caused the damage, but also dry rot and faulty mortar. After the war, building materials were scarce, and you had to have a license to make repairs to private houses. The licenses were few and far between. Quite a dangerous place there. You might walk over and get killed. The real threat, though, was the idea that these buildings represented a way of life which had gone for good. They need dozens of servants to run them, and hardly anyone wanted to be a servant anymore. So at Gosford, as elsewhere, they simply gave up and took the roof off. The north wing was left open to the elements. The 1945 election was a landslide victory for Labour. At the polling booths, the people of Great Britain voted for the welfare state and nationalisation of coal, paid for by taxing the rich. In socialist Britain, the interests of the landed aristocracy seemed utterly irrelevant. Hugh Edward Conway Seymour, 8th Marquess of Harford, Earl of Yarmouth, Viscount Beecham, Lord Conway, Baron Conway of Ragley and Baron Conway of Kilalta, grew up at Ragley in Worcestershire. He was nine years old when he inherited the numerous titles, the estate and the house. I've always thought my mother was a little bit casual. No, she didn't tell me. I, I was lying in bed um, with some nasal problem of, of some sort at my prep school, Luglev, and um, reading, I think it was a daily sketch, uh, I saw a tiny headline saying boy of nine, and because I was nine years old myself, I looked to see what boy of nine had done. To my complete astonishment, I read that Hugh Edward Conway Seymour had become the eighth Marquess of Harford on the death of his uncle. 
And I thought, I really did wonder for a moment if there could be some other little boy of nine also called who would call me Seaman. And then I thought, no, the, 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 that, can't, that can't be. Uh, but I didn't even know I had an uncle called Lord Harford. Because the new Lord Harford was only a child, trustees were appointed to run Ragley on his behalf. During the war, they made the house available to the Red Cross as a hospital for wounded soldiers. It only made Ragley all the more exciting for the young Lord Harford. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful house for children. And of course, <clears throat> during the war, when the house was a hospital, although this film was rather out of bounds because it, it, was, it had 50 beds in it, I always had partners for tennis because it was a convalescent hospital and so there were always a few patients uh, who were ready, able and willing to play tennis with me. In 1946 the hospital closed and the Red Cross said goodbye to Ragley, leaving the house back in the care of the family. Uh, the Red Cross had paid for the central heating and my mother then decided we couldn't afford the central heating. I don't know if we really couldn't or not. But the winter of 1947 was bitterly cold and we had no heating at all. We just had rather small log fires. When Lord Harford was 17, his mother and the trustees decided that it was no longer practical to live at Ragley and that the family should move out. My mother moved to a farmhouse, oh, only about a mile from here. Um, a farmhouse on the estate, you know. I did hate it. Horace Walpole, for instance, who fits quite nicely over the fireplace there, in, in the farmhouse dining room, he was floor to ceiling <laughs> and looked ridiculous as a result. Um, and so much of our furniture is quite big, and it, it, no, I, I never felt comfortable there. I really hated it, but all, it was more than that. It was, of course, an admission of defeat as far as I was concerned. Um, and I was absolutely determined to move back into this house as soon as possible. The trustees stayed in control of the house and estate until Lord Harford was 21. They believed the family would never live at Ragley again, and they allowed the house to slide into disrepair. Then they decided that Ragley Hall should be demolished. It was an appalling idea, and I really was horrified, uh, so I did what I'd been told was the rudest thing you could possibly do. I sent all my trustees postcards in pencil, saying, I hope the subject of the demolition of Ragley will never again be mentioned. Hugh Harford had prevented his trustees from demolishing Ragley, but he still had to find a way to keep the building standing. It was a problem faced by aristocrats across the country. In the introduction to Brideshead Revisited, Evelyn Waugh warned that the ancestral seats of Britain were doomed to decay and spoliation like the monasteries in the 16th century. But when some aristocrats started demolishing their ancestral seats because they could no longer afford to keep them up, the National Trust became concerned and launched a scheme to help preserve them. Unless something is done to preserve these beautiful old country houses and gardens, in a generation, half of them will be in ruins through taxation and death duties. James Lees Milne had the job of visiting and assessing the threatened mansions for the National Trust. When the Trust took on a house, it wanted the family to continue to live there. I have been accused lately uh, of fostering the interests of the landed gentry at the expense of the, the poor public. Well, of course, that's absolute piffle. We didn't think that at all. But we knew that unless we were nice to the owners, in other words, could give them some assurance that they could go on living in the houses or part of the houses, we wouldn't get them at all. James Lees Milne kept a diary of his experiences, including a visit by bicycle to Lord and Lady Berwick, at Attingham Hall. I turned smartly left under an imposing archway off the main Wellington Road. But when the great house hove into sight, a moment of apprehension assailed me. Would Lord and Lady Berwick be very formidable? What would they think of an official from London arriving on a two-wheeler? Lord and Lady Berwick were surprisingly unreserved in explaining that in spite of a large estate, the house was a cruel burden to them. But it had to be preserved at all costs, however onerous 
and the marvellous contents kept intact. They were very hard up, and, uh, and the place was in a pretty bad way. They were rather desperate, I think. And, I, and the trust help, was a help to them. But the trust could not help every impoverished aristocrat who turned to them. The Earl of Stradbroke failed to persuade them to help him with Henham Hall in Suffolk. The trust could only take on properties which came with a substantial endowment and were of real architectural importance. Very often I would go, sometimes long journey, to Northumberland or outer part of the country, furthest parts, and, and, and even have to stay a night or two to discuss the future of this house. And I might see going up the drive that it clearly wasn't a very important house. So I had to pretend. And I never would say to them, I'm afraid this house is no good. I never did that, even if they asked me. Tuesday, 9th of July, 1946. Reached Wolseley Hall at three. This place, the property of Sir Edric Wolseley, has belonged to his family since the conquest. House has a very fine Charles II staircase, but is much altered since first erected. In all other respects, the house is a poor specimen. Grounds and park likewise indifferent. Whole place disintegrating. Sir Edric's grandson, Sir Charles Wolseley, now walks his dog where Wolseley Hall once stood. Uh, the National Trust weren't in the least interested. James Lees Milne came and looked at it and met my grandparents, and it's mentioned in one of his diaries. A rather amusing view he took of my, my grandparents. They, poor things, rather eccentric. We preferred him. Michael was much shocked by the unmade beds and the fuzzy, unbrushed Catholic hair of our hostess. Anyway, the National Trust wouldn't touch it with a barge pole, with or without an endowment, and, and quite rightly. Uh, it needed a million pounds even to slightly restore it, which I didn't have. I still had to pay the estate duty on my grandfather's death. And uh, it was a, a case of demolishing it. This picture, of course, is one of the last ones of the hall taken, and this shows the demolition in progress. There was very little option. Between 1945 and 1955, over 400 stately homes were demolished. At one point, they were coming down at the rate of one every five days. The Labour government was surprisingly sympathetic to the plight of the houses. It commissioned the Gowers Report, which set in motion a new view of the aristocracy and their houses. Like the National Trust, the Gowers Report argued that aristocrats should be helped to stay in their homes. A reinvention of the purpose of the aristocracy was taking place. Aristocrats as guardians of our architectural heritage. In the old families, there is no sense of possession. Instead, they belong to the homes which they receive in trust, cherish and pass on. Thus the great houses make our history live. To save them from death is the aim of the Gower's report. Just after the war, these places were meant to be absolutely useless, redundant, never wanted again, nobody was interested in those sort of things. It was thought to be terrible that one person should own or be responsible for a place like this. And now if you try and keep the roof on, you're meant to be a sort of hero. The Gower's report led to actual government cash to help towards the upkeep of these houses. At Ragley, Hugh Half had applied for a grant to restore the roof. When the money was slow to arrive, he applied some pressure. I was asked to give a talk to the Council for the Preservation of Royal England uh, in London. And so I took the opportunity and I told the press in advance that I was going to make a reasonably important statement and it was, in fact, televised, as well as attracting a lot of press. And I announced that, unless I got government help, Ragley would have to be pulled down, which uh, I must admit was bluff. <laughs> uh, 
um, luckily, my bluff was not called. I did get a very large government grant. In fact, at the time, it was the biggest grant that it had ever been given to any house. It was, I think, £100,000 um, in land figures. Lord Harford's grant exemplified the change in attitude. The great houses of Britain now represented our national heritage. Where possible, their owners should be helped with public money. But in return for a grant, they had to let the public in. The stately homes of England, how beautiful they stand. Amid their tall ancestral trees or all this pleasant land. But what they say today is this. The stately homes of England, how lucrative they stand. All over Britain, the great houses were opening their doors to the public, and the public paid willingly. By 1960, there were over 200,000 visitors a year at Chatsworth, and nearly 600 other houses were also open. And for the visitors, the chance to snoop on the aristocracy at home was at least as enticing as the architectural splendours of house and garden. I'm very glad to welcome you here to Chatsworth this afternoon, and I feel very flattered that... Uh, you have found the time to visit the house. Before you go into it, uh, I would just say this, that when you get inside, I hope you will look at it, not as you would look at a museum, but as somebody's home, because uh, this house is my family's home, and that although it has many beautiful things in it, there are also many not so good uh, and, and beautiful, but just ordinary workaday things in it. It is a home uh, and not a museum. At Woburn, the Duke of Bedford capitalised on the best attraction of all, the chance to meet a real live aristocrat. Probably the most popular sideshow is this, the Duke's stepdaughter, his duchess, and the Duke himself selling souvenirs. All this puts the Duke of Bedford about 130,000 visitors ahead of his nearest rival. The rivalry for the public's half-crowns meant aristocrats were now having to market themselves as a tourist attraction. Dukes, who once ruled Britain from behind their palace gates, now wooed the public and charmed the tea room queues. At Ragley, Hugh Harford had his work cut out to make the house ready to receive the public. Everything that could possibly be covered in dark brown varnish was <laughs> all dark brown paint. And as you see, the wallpaper was fairly dark and pretty shabby. Yes, we, we have, over the last 40 years, done up just about 100 rooms, but we left this one on purpose because we thought nobody would believe that the whole house looked like this way back in 1956. Ragley was largely repapered, repainted and refurnished. But not every member of the family shared Hugh Harford's enthusiasm for letting in the hoi polloi. Uh, my elder sister was absolutely, genuinely horrified and not tactful at all. She hated the whole thing. The first um, minibus that we bought for, to get the staff to and fro, I not only put Ragley Hall on both sides, I also had put it on the front and, and uh, had a covenant carved <laughs> um, to, to go above the sign saying Ragley Hall. I remember my sister saying bitterly to me, you might, why don't you wear the covenant if you're so keen on it or something? And I said, well, I think it looked rather silly as I'm wearing jeans, you know. <laughs> if I'd thought it would help, I probably would have gone around wearing it. And I remember I sat in the Great Hall selling guidebooks to people who came in on that first Easter Saturday. And um, I think we had 200 visitors on the Saturday, which was not very exciting. And on the Sunday we had 1,000, which was wonderful. And on the Monday, Easter Monday, uh, we had, I think, uh, 4,000. Um, which was absolutely unbelievable. But the public were fickle and easily put off. That first summer, it rained practically every night for six weeks, and we lost all the money that we'd made during the summer. We ended up, after six months, extremely hard work. Um, no, no better off at all. Come inside, Adam Thank you. It was clear that to keep the enterprise afloat, Hugh Harford needed to come up with a unique attraction. 
his solution, water skiing. We got going and we built a, a ski jump. I fell in the first 17 times I went over it. And we put a, 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 a flaming hoop over it with, with straw covered in tar and, and set fire to it and jumped through that. And thousands of people came. And it really was a huge success because at that time, 1960, nobody or very few people had ever even seen water skiing unless they'd been to the south of France or somewhere. So it was a new thing, and Birmingham flocked in vast numbers and cheered every time I fell in, which was quite awful. And I remember there was one day uh, after a, a Whit Monday bank holiday when we'd actually had 7,000 people watching the water skiing. And I was driving down to the bank that evening with a little clerk from the estate office who came as my um, sort of escort to be safe. And I was, as I was driving, I was juggling these leather bags full of money. Uh, and uh, I said, do you realize that we have taken enough money in one day to buy a new mo motor car? And gloomy little man, he said, yes, or your lordship could reduce the overdraft. Of course, I bought the car. I bought a wonderful Dame Ladard. <laughs> At Stapleford Park in Leicestershire, Lord Gretton used public opening as an excuse to indulge in his favourite hobby, trains. He did it on a grand scale. There were nearly two miles of track which wound through the parkland and past the lake. There were embankments and tunnels, and at the far end of the line there was a bridge over the river. There were turntables, signal boxes and sidings. Lord Gretton built four stations, employed seven men and had three steam engines. But the real highlight of a trip to Stapleford Park was the train journey down to the lake, where you could board a miniature liner for a 15-minute boat trip. Sometimes on a summer evening, if the family were just here, he'd say to my mum, shall we take a tray of drinks down onto the, onto the lake and go and have a little cruise before dinner? And so we'd load up the ice bucket and the gin and tonic and some glasses and some crisps and go down and take the boat out and it was lovely. And I think he would sit there and imagine that we were cruising off the Isle of Wight or <laughs> somewhere in the Mediterranean. The boats were exact replicas of Northern Star liners and the trip on the lake was thrown in for the admission price of two and six. It didn't pay. Not ours, anyhow. I think we were perhaps a little extravagant in the way we did it. <laughs> Lord Gretton went well beyond what was needed to provide a good day out for all the family. In the search for more and more detail, he pressed retired farm worker Harry Taylor into service. My father had him sitting on the railway embankment with a little notice in front of him and it said old Harry the official train spotter and he sat there all afternoon with his notebook and we didn't abandon him somebody from the tea room would take him his little tray of tea and make sure it was all right but on a nice day I think he really used to enjoy it it was five days a week I think you see and um, so you were on the go all the time it was quite hard work. One was quite tired at the end. At the end of the season, you really needed to go away for a break. On bank holidays, the public flocked to see Stapleford Park, but it takes a lot of half crowns to keep up a house with 50 rooms. Only a handful of stately homes open to the public actually made a profit, and Stapleford Park was not among them. The house is now a hotel, and the trains no longer run. One of the biggest threats to aristocratic wealth was the increase in taxation, particularly death duties. 
At Chatsworth, they tried to take avoiding action. The old duke handed everything over to his son. If he could live for five years after the gift, the death duties would be greatly reduced. But he died 14 weeks before the deadline, leaving the family to pay tax at 80% on their entire estate. Five million pounds with interest accumulating at a thousand pounds a day. However, the debt could be partly paid by gifts of art to the nation. It was very painful and uh, we had to find 80%. It meant uh, uh, 12 or so made uh, chief works of art um, went uh, uh, to the nation and, of course, a lot of cash and a great deal of land. The debt took 17 years to pay and the new duke had to get rid of Hardwick Hall, one of their seven houses. But luck and judicious arrangements meant that in the end, the Devonshires came out of it rather well. It was penal taxation, but when it came to the works of art, uh, we didn't do it uh, nearly as bad as we might. Well, this is one of the six dukes' uh, uh, more famous acquisitions, uh, the Landseer portrait, it's called Trial by Jury. Yeah, I think it's very popular with the public, but it's a, a good contrast to, to the wall opposite, where we've got the really lovely remnant and two very good houses. Uh, looking at this picture gives me enormous pleasure, which is perhaps rather uncharitable, because uh, when we had our tax problems, we had three remnants, and uh, we had to cede uh, uh, one remnant to the nation, and they chose one. And... Uh, then, uh, not so very long ago, about 15 years ago, the experts uh, decided that the one in the National Gallery was School of Rembrandt, whereas our two uh, were the Royal McCoy, so that was rather satisfactory. It is a, a really wonderful portrait. Uh, I think particularly the hands. After all, that thumb is really the most marvellous bit of painting. The School of Rembrandt picture which belongs to the nation is now worth less than £50,000. This one, which the family kept, is one of the great Rembrandts and is worth many millions. In the 1951 election, the Tories were returned to power. Over the next decade, the aristocracy enjoyed something of a revival of its political influence. Churchill, grandson to a duke, returned to number 10. Churchill, Winston Spencer, 40,000. I uh, wish you all, whatever party you belong, good fortune for yourselves and for our island home. Four years later, Churchill was replaced by the aristocrat Anthony Eden, who in turn was replaced by Harold Macmillan, uncle by marriage to the Duke of Devonshire. In 1962, the journalist Anthony Sampson wrote a book, Anatomy of Britain, dissecting the power structure of the country. In it, he included an elaborate family tree showing the still impressive connections at the top of the British establishment. The Prime Minister was related by marriage to the President of the United States, the British Ambassador to Washington, the British Secretary for War, the editors of The Observer and The Times, and the Governor of the Bank of England as well as 35 members of his own government. That interconnection, which was what a lot of people thought of as the establishment, was when you looked at it, it was rather closer than I'd thought. It was, of course, in some ways misleading because some of these families hated each other and some of the spouses were at loggerheads with their husbands and so on. Uh, so you wouldn't probably find them all in the same room at the same wedding party, for instance. But nevertheless, it was a network. The important thing, I think, it was a communications network, which was, at that time, was unbeatable. Macmillan's government was a fruitful subject for such familial study. His wife was one of the Devonshire family, and Macmillan promoted many of her relations. Well, Macmillan was undoubtedly a snob. I mean, he married into the aristocracy. He was rather unsure of himself in that context. He was really an intellectual, a Scotsman who was rich, but not grand, by background, rather puritanical family. Uh, and he did love to feel himself being part of that world, which had in the past actually been rather rude to him. They had thought him rather as a priggish bore, and he had a bit of a complex about that. 
But in a sense, I think by becoming Prime Minister, he was getting his own back. And he was showing them who was the boss and bringing them into government in order, in some ways, to be able to uh, parade his own uh, equality or superiority over dukes and uh, grandees generally. One of the dukes Macmillan brought into government was his nephew by marriage, the Duke of Devonshire. It was the most monstrous act of nepotism that's ever taken place in modern politics. Uh, my uncle by marriage, Homer Macmillan, had always been a very good friend to me, uh, and uh, we got on very well. And uh, he, th he knew I liked politics, and so he thought he'd make me a minister. He wouldn't have done it unless he thought I could make a reasonable fist of it. But still, uh, it, it, it could not be justified. But Harold Macmillan made two lasting changes to the political power base of the aristocracy, the House of Lords. In 1958, he introduced life peers, men and women who were given a title and a seat in the House of Lords, but who could not pass this on to their heirs. Among the earliest life peers was Lord Allport, previously a Tory MP. The idea was that you would dilute the hereditary peerage uh, and would enable, at the same time, for the government of the day to exercise patronage, which is important to governments, and be able to create peers without flooding the whole country with hereditary peers. It was a huge change to the makeup of the House of Lords and the meaning of titles. The whole idea that you could make an ordinary chap a life peer without the kind of obligations to, or the assumptions of it being a sort of dynasty that you were establishing, that was new. The power to, again, to make and break people from number 10 was enormously increased. And the idea that one, one day our mister, the next day our lord, all because you've been sucking up to the prime minister, was a tremendous extra element. But there were a few lords who wanted to revert to being misters. In 1960, Anthony Wedgwood Ben inherited a peerage. He then began a lengthy campaign to be allowed to give it up and stay in the House of Commons. Wedgwood Ben, 20,300. the Tory cabinet. You have defeated the House of Lords. You have defeated the courts. You have changed the constitution of this country by your own power. And that is a very great achievement. A very great achievement. And I am very, very proud indeed to be sent back for the sixth time to represent you in the House of Commons. Ben's by-election victory forced Macmillan to change the law so that peers could renounce their titles. One of the first peers to follow Ben in giving up his title was the 14th Earl of Hume, Macmillan's preferred successor as Prime Minister. Thank you so much. And when, of course, Macmillan was succeeded by the Earl of Hume, um, that was even more, obviously, the, the last sort of uh, desperate... Uh, attempt to pretend that Britain was run by an aristocratic system, and that, in a sense, I think, took the drama into farce. Lord Hume, sir, yes, Lord Hume. can you tell me if you've managed to tell the Queen that you're going to form a government? Yes, I have, and I've kissed hands on appointment as Prime Minister. Have does, any of your senior colleagues refused to serve, sir? I've never had No, we're going to work together to win the next election. Does this mean you'll be giving up your title, sir? What? Does this mean you'll be giving up your title? Oh, yes, I think it will Alec Douglas Hume's political career was by no means ineffective, but his patrician style was now thoroughly outdated. The election of 1964 was won by the Labour Party. Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson lost no opportunity to mock the disappointed Tories and their aristocratic leaders. Let us be understanding. Let us not condemn them too harshly. For remember that these are men who thought that at birth they were ordained by providence to rule over their fellow citizens and to find themselves rudely deprived of the powers they exercised cannot have been easy for them. Like many governments before and since, Wilson's Labour government promised to preside over a new Britain. By the mid-60s, the talk was all of a classless society, a meritocracy. The gossip columns were dominated by pop stars and media personalities, 
and some of the more resourceful aristocrats reinvented themselves as 60s people. Lord Harford became a PR man, and the Earl of Lichfield a photographer. I suppose this group represents to some extent an emergence of a sort of meritocracy. The, um, these were people who were either successful uh, or potentially successful, um, who came from myriad backgrounds, but constantly were almost producing groups like this, which was really for American consumption, or, hey, look at us, uh, this is the new class order in Britain, these are the people that matter, these are the other movers and shakers. Pop stars like Ray Davis, boxers like Terry Downs, and filmmakers like Roman Polanski. The old London society seemed to have gone. Now, at the parties everyone wanted to go to, were artists like David Hockney, and actresses like Susanna York, journalists, PR men, photographers, and hairdressers. A really interesting group of people who, some of them, if you like, monosyllabic, but they still had something more interesting to say to each other than the, than the social, um, uh, samey groups that used to meet before that. Doug Hayward and Michael Caine, um, two so-called Cockneys. They were very much part of the London scene. Uh, they were both successful. It was interesting that Doug um, who had been in the Navy, um, had come out and become a tailor's apprentice and actually used to go around with belts of cloth and make people's suits in their city offices. And the, the reason that he's not just a very, very good tailor, but he's an extremely interesting and entertaining man. And so really going to Doug's shop became almost like going to a club, a lot more interesting than going to some English club, I think, tell you. Doug Hayward's aristocratic clients treated him more like a friend than a tailor something which would never have happened in the past. Well, they all became friends, basically. They all became friends of mine. And, uh, well, not all of them, but I mean, a lot of them did. And I found myself getting invited away for country weekends, and come and stay on my boat, and things like that sort of stuff. But the thing about that is not to do it. It's nice to be asked, but don't do it. Because then they realize you're just, you're not so special after all, and they spend a bit of time with you. <laughs> Why did they ask, do you think? Well, because I was the mascot at the time. I mean, I was a little cockney tailor around the corner. I was only 27 of them. I would hate it if people thought that I was his tame peer or he was my tame cockney. Life is not like that. I sometimes get extremely angry when I think people are as patronising as that. Um, He's always been a good mate, and it doesn't matter where he came from. I think the great thing about the 60s was it gave he, he, it gave he and I access to each other. Now, that hadn't happened before. It would have been much more difficult until this class barrier, so-called class barrier, came crashing down. Hayward was one of a group of working-class men who found themselves in the limelight. Others included journalist Michael Parkinson and photographer Terry O'Neill. The change was so dramatic that they couldn't believe it was for real. It that's wasn't going to last. That you're going to have to go oh, no, back. When you're 25, you're going to have to do what your mum wanted. Work in I the bank. Absolutely, it's true. You're waiting People for a tap on the shoulder that. all the time. Waiting for someone to say, "Come on, yeah. you've got away with it for about 20 years. I've been watching you. Come back where you belong." Yeah. And so you actually, although you could never quite do it, you always imagine you could. That's all at the back of your mind. It can't last. Got a game going on, and I'm winning at the moment. Part of the, of the fun was imagining we were stuffing the aristocracy. <laughs> but they're both centuries of experience of stuffing us. I don't think they're ahead of the game, actually. Yeah. I never saw class really as an issue until the 60s told us that it didn't exist. Um, or voices in the 60s told us that it didn't exist, which just reminded us how much it did. And uh, we all thought we went through an extraordinary classless time. We didn't at all. Lord Litchfield socialised with models but he married the daughter of the Duke of Westminster. When it came to marriage, the aristocracy still preferred to stick together. I just think it is easier if you are going to ultimately have to live in a background which is prepared. I mean, we've seen it happen in the royal family. Uh, that if you don't adapt to the system, the system sure isn't going to adapt to you. Um, so 
even though it may have changed, it hasn't changed so much uh, that decade or generation after generation of, of the same sort of thing going on, however stuffy you may think it is, it still does actually have a meaning and a bearing on, on a, a, a girl who's going to marry into it. She's got to sort of to toe the line and learn the rules. The whole question of marriage and succession remained as important to the aristocracy as ever. As in most families, at Haddo House in Aberdeenshire, the strict rules of inheritance have kept the estate and titles together for centuries. David Gordon, the fourth Marquis of Aberdeen, married June Boissier, a music student. Together they founded a music festival, which still continues at Haddo. Okay. June didn't come from a titled or landed family herself. She was the daughter of the headmaster of Harrow. Right. You all got the serenade, yes. have you? Right. Okay. For some 40 years, June Lady Aberdeen has run Haddo with great energy, but sadly she couldn't have children. Eventually they adopted, first a daughter, Mary, and then two boys and another girl. They went against some family opposition to do so because these children could never inherit either title or estate. Under the rules of aristocratic succession, only blood counts. By aristocratic standards, the children had a normal upbringing, but the fact of their adoption was never far from the surface. I think we, we all suffer from it, um, because I don't think children like being different. And I remember Sarah and I going to a party in a castle quite near here, and it, all the nannies were sort of behind the children's chairs, making sure they had the bread and butter before the jelly and the chocolate cake. And uh, there were two mothers discussing us, as if we couldn't hear. I mean, people always assume that children are deaf, I think. And um, oh, the little Gordon girls, of course, you know they're adopted. And it made, it's almost as if there was something slightly not quite right about it. And I think we grew up feeling that we were sort of second best in a way. If you think how many titles have descended, through the wrong side of the blanket, I think it's a great shame. I, I, I just don't mind, I mean, now I did mind, of course, very much. It's a great sorrow that you can't produce children, but on the other hand, I've had so much else, you see. When June's husband died, the title could not pass to their adopted son. Instead, it went sideways, eventually to her husband's brother, Alistair, and his wife. Well, a lot of people round and about said, look here, what on earth's going on? Because we started off as Mr and Mrs Gordon, then we were Lord and Lady Alistair Gordon, then we were Marcus and Marcus of Aberdeen. And, I think um, the shops confused... and thought we were inventing it all. I, I don't know, they thought we were bringing it up <laughs> as we went along. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anything to get a bit better, you know, <laughs> get a better deal. <laughs> yes. See, I've got ten titles, and um, the courtesy one of Earl of Haddo goes to a son, and then his elder son is the Viscount, one of the Vi I've got two Viscounts. They're just a sort of a, a string of, of titles which I have, and one, so to speak, is dishes them out. <laughs> to the appropriate people. The current Lord and Lady Aberdeen chose not to move back to Haddo, but stayed in their house in Berkshire, where they each have a studio. He's an accomplished botanical painter, and Lady Aberdeen is a ceramicist. As the granddaughter of an earl herself, the sixth Lady Aberdeen believes succession by blood is important. It's just one of the rules. And I think you've got, if you've got a family who've been in possession of a place for a very long time, you, you want to keep the blood line going. I mean, I feel very strongly about that. I think it's very important because you've got to... Uh, certain sort of characteristics about families which you've just got to go on through, if you can, if you can. I mean, it's lovely if you can. To avoid death duties, the estate was passed to their son, Alexander, while he was still a schoolboy. In due course, he will inherit the full title. Actually, it's worked out rather well because our son, I think, is going to be very good at doing the job. 
and there wasn't anybody else. We were the only ones with any children, so that it was a bit of luck, really. In Britain, large estates and titles have been held together from generation to generation by the strict rule of male primogeniture. Here, the eldest son inherits everything. On the continent, estates are split up among the children. The British rule of aristocratic succession is ruthless, but it works. But for June Lady Aberdeen, the fact that her adopted children cannot inherit so much as a title still rankles. The only sad thing is that a life peer's children can be called honourable. The legitimately adopted children of a Marquis can be called nothing, and they have to explain to everybody. But if they could just have an honourable like a life peer, then they wouldn't have to explain why they've got nothing. I think they've got over it now, but the youngest one minded very much. I don't know why he did, but he did. The aristocracy continues to take the concept of breeding seriously. They believe their genetic inheritance has stood them in good stead for many centuries and will continue to do so in the modern world. I think you have to remember that um, the aristocracy, the, the peerage, the nobility, whatever you like to call it, are a very much more resilient lot than you would actually give them credit for. Um, you will find that they are a lot tougher, a lot tougher. I've learnt this as I've got older. I actually include myself, and I'm quite surprised at how resilient we are. And I think that we are less daunted by uh, the onset of a potential socialist government than most people think we are. Looking at the aristocracy up to the present day next Wednesday on BBC Two. That's at the same time, nine o'clock. <laughs>